Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, someone smarter than us once told us that uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And uh, we thoroughly believe that, we, and uh, which is why we're about to reward you loyal listeners for just that very fact. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals, and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And if you like how we do things around here, and I'm going to assume that you do, because you're listening right now, you can subscribe to the podcast. You can find us over at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, basically wherever you get your podcasts. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In The Seats YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we would absolutely appreciate it. Also, uh, don't hesitate to go find us on social media. We are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, and we are on Instagram. Either at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, and I say this a lot, but it's true, it's the most important. Please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, basically the moving image at large, because, as I always say, if we love to uh, write about it and talk about it, we love it when you come by and listen about it and read about it. So please pay us a visit and stop on by. On this episode, oh my goodness, boys and girls, it was worth the wait for you because we have the one and only Mr. Oliver Stone is a guest on today's show. You heard me right. We are talking with the one and only Oliver Stone and we are talking about his brand new, uh, well, sort of brand new, but it's, it's a four part documentary limited series, which is on video on demand platforms as we speak and is called JFK destiny betrayed. Uh, which is basically uh, sort of an extended version of JFK Revisited Through the Looking Glass, which was a feature that he had at Con, I believe, uh, last year, the year before, but then it also ended up on Showtime. Uh, But, and that's also, and coincidentally enough, you can also find that on your favorite video on-demand platforms as well. But we talked with Mr. Stone about, uh, I guess, how... uh, this subject of JFK really shaped his life and just how uh, much much deeper he goes into it. And we talk about the influences and we talk about the book upon which a lot of it is based. And it's really a, a fascinating, fascinating uh, deep dive in, in into what happened, into the corruption, into the uh, blind incompetence in many ways as well and it's it's just a stunning stunning story that he really dives into incredibly deeply uh that still has relevance today written by uh james uh d genio uh based off his book uh oh mr stone does a great job with it and uh we talk about sort of the story of jfk how it applies today and so very very much more i cannot recommend this series enough so go check out your favorite video on demand platforms uh to see either uh this this uh, new series uh jfk destiny betrayed or you can revisit jfk revisited through the looking glass in feature film form which are both available like i said on your favorite video on demand platforms now but first off uh, please enjoy our talk with Oliver Stone because between you and me, it's a good one. All right, well, Oliver, first, first off, just thank you so much for the time today. Thank you, David, for taking the time. Now, I mean, congratulations not only on the film, on the series, but I mean, I was, I was so struck by it, just having been not just a fan of your work, but always just sort of fascinated by the story as well. And I had actually kind of forgotten. Uh, just about the fervor that your film had really sort of stirred up when it came out back in 91. And I'm kind of curious, well, obviously this is inspired by James's book. Like, was there always something in the back of your mind to sort of go deeper into the story, especially sort of in the aftermath of the film in 91? Well, not really. No, I started out pretty naive. I, I didn't think it would be that contested. I thought that it was a kind of a lull. It had been all these investigations, the House Select Assassinations Committee, and, you know, HSCA was behind us. 
and I thought it was a good thriller. That's the way I approached it. Like a Z, you remember the movie Z? Like, try take this story and show what happened in a mythical way, kind of. This is a, I said at the time, I said the Warren Commission's a great myth because it was such nonsense. Three bullets, one assassin. So clean and neat, it wasn't that way at all. And all the evidence pointed in other directions. So, but, and I thought, uh, it's a myth. I'm going to create a counter myth. And that's what I said at the time. But it turns out that it wasn't such a counter myth after all. There's much more truth there than you think. I did a hell of a lot of research and I had a tremendous amount of help from researchers. These researchers are the, the key to the case. They're the guys, civilians, men, women, who went into the story, who examined the Warren Commission. These are not government people. These are civilians who took an interest, loved John Kennedy or whatever reason, and actually investigated and logically figured out this case. You need to be Sherlock Holmes. You, gotta, you, need, you need a magnifying glass. You got to look at all the details. There's a thousand details. These people did that. And that's what I presented in, in the film uh, dramatically. I didn't do it as a documentary, dramatically. And that caused so much anger and furor. People wanted to ban it and, uh, before it came out. There was so, so much uh, criticism of it. It was shocking for me. I, I kind of had to wake up fast and realize that this was a much bigger deal than I thought it was when I started it. It's no, it's no longer just a murder mystery like Z. This is a national trauma. And that's what I've seen for all these years now. So 30 years go by and my film creates the Assassination Records Review Board, which reinvestigates the case. They had declassif declassifying powers and they also had some limited investigatory powers. They worked for four years. They went through everything pretty well, everything, and they came out with surprising amount of detail. Again, detail. And not, the press doesn't have any patience for detail. It just ignored it. And most of the stuff was unreported. We had to go back and basically make a legacy piece. I, we decided, let's take all the information they, they found out. Let's take out anything new also we found out and bring it together into one legacy piece, a documentary. That turned into a four hour debacle, four hour uh, Kennedy uh, Best Destiny Betrayed, JFK Destiny Betrayed. Nobody wanted to buy it. We cut it to two hours, which is JFK Through the Looking Glass, which is less information, and put that out at Cannes Film Festival. That was picked up on, sold in many countries, and much admired. And here we are, uh, we released it finally in America through Showtime. And now on March 8th, it's been uh, non-exclusive to Showtime. We're showing it on all platforms. Uh, you can get it across the board, Amazon, et cetera. And also we're gonna release the four hour version through Shout Factory, which is a smaller distributor, but very good one. And they're putting out a digital uh, purchase of the four hour. You can purchase it digitally. Uh, that's where we stand. So we're getting it out and it's being received. No, no, uh, no major media press. We don't get any coverage from the, the New York Times or uh, Los Angeles Times, any of that. We have to live with that. But we're getting a hell of a lot of good coverage from the uh, internet, from the alternate press. Well, that's I, that's I guess that's me. But but thank you for that. And I mean, I, I I got to watch them both, and it does feel. Like, I'm glad I got to watch the feature before I watched the four hour series. It almost felt like it was this more introductory and sort of sort of primed me for sort of the amount of information that the four hour cut gives us. And I mean, I was so struck by not just the detail, but I guess in my mind, like as you broke all through all this down, it really felt like it was the collision of ineptitude and corruption. Because I mean, even from simple things like chain of evidence and how those things went like horribly awry, I, I was kind of curious as you dove into the book and as you dove more into the subject, was there anything that even caught you off guard at this stage? This work was done by researchers. You have to understand, I am not a researcher. I'm not, it's another occupation. You have right. to, it's a full-time job. You see in the film all the people who we, we interview who have done their homework or dig, dug, 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 dug. They're still digging. There's wonderful people. These are citizens. They're just doing it because they care. And yeah. so in other words, I'm basically the recipient. This film was written by Jim DiEugenio, who was one of those researchers, third generation a guy who honestly has this memory that I can't believe. It's like the Chinese puzzle palace. He remembers every book he read, every detail. Amazing man. And he, he put this together. 
So uh, I'm, uh, I'm, right, I'm making a documentary here. I'm not making a feature film. I'm not being a director. I simply interview people and putting it together, editing it. Uh, is that, does that answer your question? I forgot, I lost the- uh, No, it kind of does, but it also dovetails into something else I wanted to ask because obviously you worked with uh, the great Robert Richardson as your sort of DP on this, but, and this might be a simple or a dumb question to even ask, but what is the role of a cinematographer or a director of photography on a, on a documentary like this, where you're well, dealing with so much archive footage. Well, there's so much, uh, there are so many interviews. There's about 30 interviews or 25. We, yeah. have, to, we, we, we have to like those interviews. And, and uh, I think they're beautifully lit. And they, they are. And they help us understand this, what all this evidence means. Now, I mean, something else that, like in watching the film, and you put the clip from your own film in this one, uh, from Donald Sutherland Wine, just uh, the real question is why uh, the the how and the who were scenery, and yeah. that really feels like it's it's a line that sort of sums up this entire story. And I'm kind of curious, yeah, from your perspective, why has the why never why did the why get so obscured so easily? Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? To me, yeah. it's amazing because it's been going on so long. It's the, the media has completely turned off the spigot on this. They will not go there. They will not look. You have to understand the Kennedy foreign policy and domestic policy and the changes he was enacting and working on for his second term. He was popular, but he was also very controversial. He was hated too. In the South, he'd lost the South because of his policies on integration in, in uh, Mississippi and in Alabama. It didn't look like he would win those states. That's why he was fighting so hard for Texas when he died, because Lyndon Johnson was his vice president. But uh, he didn't have the South. And also people hated him for being soft on the communism. That was a big rap that he was going for detente, that he liked the Russians. Same thing is going on now. You can't like the Russians in America. You have to, you have to be their enemy. You have to fight them. So he, he, what he did was avoid two wars. I mean, basically, Bay of Pigs was, he, he did not commit U.S., military to the to the Bay of Pigs to help the Cuban refugees. He said no, repeatedly, and the CIA didn't believe him. They thought he'd come in at the last second. He didn't. That was a big no-no. He looked like a coward to them. And then a year, a year or so later, the Cuban Missile Crisis happens, and he's repeatedly told, go into Cuba. Bomb. Bomb the, bomb the shit out of them. Take out these uh, Russian missiles. They didn't know that those missiles were nuclear, but take out the Russian uh, contingent, the 100,000 in Cuba. And on top of it, uh, they wanted him to invade Cuba and get it over with, because they were, you can't have communism 90 miles from the US. The greatest thing he did for mankind was say no, because that is amazing. People don't understand the un contribution. That was enough to be president for life, because avoiding nuclear war is really important. I can't tell you. And it would have turned into something monstrous. Mm -hmm. And he said no. And that was his death warrant, I believe. He refused to go to these wars. He was too much of a, what they call the traitor. And that was evident from all the people we talked to. The, in the four hour version, you see the typical FBI agent, Elmer Moore, who twists the testimony of Malcolm Perry and the doctor in Dallas. And he says he was a traitor. JFK was a traitor. And he says it very clearly. Remember that moment? Yes. That, you know, that's a powerful moment. Uh, and I think that was a feeling about the people who killed him, that he had betrayed the United States. That's the why. There's other reasons, too. But certainly he was taking on big business, taking on the uh, oil depletion allowance, taking on the, the he was in banknotes, the Federal Reserve. There was all kinds of things that he was cooking up in his second term. He was not going to fight the war in Vietnam. He was withdrawing. He was starting to withdraw. And he said he would not fight it second term. So what, what the American history now is that JFK is a well-spoken, attractive president, but didn't mean much in the end because he was killed short, unfinished presidency. And that Lyndon Johnson, his vice president, took over his presidency and completed and continued the task that Kennedy had started. That's absolute rubbish. Except for civil rights, it's pure rubbish. And the American historians have to really re-examine this case. And that includes people like Noam Chomsky on the left, because they, they're wrong. They're not paying attention to all the new information that's come out. Kennedy's work in Africa, Kennedy's work in Asia with Sukarno, Kennedy's work with, with the Congo, Kennedy's work in South America with the Alliance for Progress, the people he was talking to, 
the, the detente he was looking for with both Castro and with Russia. It's an amazing record, amazing record of change coming. He knew the second term would make him give him that power to get things more, more things done. And that's when that's what's been lost in this in this in this brouhaha, this excitation about his death, about the details, the scenery. That was the line given to me by Fletcher Prouty, actually. He said, the rest is scenery, you know, it's just scenery. Who did who? What, what, if you follow the Oswald story, you'll never get out of it because he has the fingerprints of intelligence all over him. No, you're absolutely right. And I mean, it's one of those things that I, I'm just so struck by sort of the interconnectivity of it all because, I mean, obviously I knew the story of Patrice Lumumba and I knew the story of Hammerschold, but I never connected the dots. And I mean, it feels like, especially at that time, yeah. uh, we weren't, the world wasn't ready to understand how interconnected the world really was. And it feels like now this story still rings true because we're almost caught up to that point. Yes, we are. I've, obviously I'm scared like you are. Yeah. This thing is getting out of hand. Uh, because you can see the United States has not changed its aggressiveness. It's the same country. Uh, you can say that no U.S. president since Kennedy has been able to confront the military sector of our economy, the, the budgets, uh, or the intelligence agencies. Not, not one of them has the guts to take them on. They're in control of, their, of a certain part of our government, in control. And unfortunately, it keeps getting worse. They keep escalating the risks. No, you're absolutely right. And I mean... It's one of those things where, I mean, I haven't looked back to some of your other work. Like, I mean, talk radio is, is a personal favorite of mine. And I mean, I can almost draw political parallels to now with that and even to take it back to issues that were going on with JFK. And it's, it's one of those things that makes it sort of really fascinating to see just how uh, the psyche, not just of America, but even of the world really hasn't changed all that much. We should have been partners with Russia back in 1990s. I don't know where this mentality came in that we need a Cold War. And it, that's what happened. There's no reason. We, we, they could have been our partners. They, we could be improving. They're, they're great on, uh, they're great on, they could be helping us with, with climate control. They have tremendous advances scientifically. They have built enormous uh, nuclear uh, energy uh, technology in Russia, enormous. They can help. We can combine with China. It could all work. There's no reason for a war. There's no reason to hate distrust. Not at all. And this is, uh, this is, but it's the United States that keeps thinking that we have enemies. This has driven the world to this edge of, again, of brinksmanship. This is crazy. No, and I mean, it's, it's, it's unsettling, but I mean, it's important to put on the screen at the same time. And I, I think in sort of revisiting the story of JFK, I mean, it's just one of those things where, at least for me as a viewer, I was so damn enthralled by sort of the realities of it and just sort of how I, like I said before, you can see corruption on one end, but then just blind incompetence on the other. And that really does feel like a statement on how we've kind of been living our lives, just sort of having them sort of butt up against one another until it gets a little too late or a little too messy, and then we have to clean it up. That's what I'm worried about. I'm worried about the mess that, oh God, we kept prodding the Russians. I, I, I did that, you know, poking the bear, so to speak. We keep doing that. No, you're absolutely right. And I mean, God willing, we'll learn. But thank you for putting it again, just for the time today. And just thank you for, again, diving into this story, which I've been fascinated for basically with my entire life. And I think you've done a fantastic job. And I think people are really going to enjoy it and people are going to be fascinated by it and hopefully open some, a few eyes at the same time. Thank you, David. And Thank you so much, Oliver. Thank you. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs. <laughs>